Lecture number one, the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Before we begin the lecture proper, I would like to make a few introductory remarks about this course itself. At the present time, many people have been developing an interest in meditation. And part of this phenomena is the interest in the Buddhist forms of meditation. But in order for the practice of Buddhist meditation to become an effective means to spiritual development, it has to be based upon a clear understanding of the purpose of meditation. The purpose itself can only be grasped when we understand the doctrinal framework underpinning the practice. To follow correctly the Dhamma, there are two things which have to go together hand in hand. One of these is understanding, the other is practice. If these two can be brought into unison, if they can be made to complement and support each other, then the pursuit of the goal can be brought to a successful conclusion. But if we have one without the other, then that can only lead, perhaps, to a futile end. To have knowledge and understanding without practice, this is like counting the property of others without owning anything ourselves. If we look at our neighbor, we might see that he has such a beautiful house, so many cars, such a nice lawn, so many nice flowers, and so on. But as long as the property belongs to the neighbor and not to ourself, then it doesn't do any good to ourself. Or again, just having knowledge without practice might be like compared to reading the menus in a restaurant without eating anything. Even if we look at all the menus of the fanciest restaurants in town, that won't satisfy our own appetite. On the other hand, to want to practice without having the understanding needed as a grounding for the practice, this also is insufficient. In order to reach a given destination, we have to know where we're starting from, where we're going, and what is the route we have to travel along to reach our goal. To practice without having that understanding This is analogous to the case of somebody who wants to travel from Washington, New York, to New York, but he doesn't know the streets of Washington, he doesn't know the streets of New York, and he doesn't know the routes leading from one city to the other. Still, he thinks that the most efficient way to reach his destination is simply to get into the car, get onto the roads, and start traveling whichever way the car will take him. In such a case, he might use a lot of gasoline and put a lot of mileage on the car, but he won't meet much success in reaching his goal in getting to New York. Thus, we need these two elements, understanding and practice, pariyati and patipati, and these have to work together hand in hand to bring about the achievement of the goal of the Buddha's teaching enlightenment and liberation. Learning can be considered not only a supplement to practice, but also as a part of practice. For the entire Buddhist discipline aims at the growth at the growth of wisdom or understanding. Wisdom is the key to realization. And the Buddha teaches that wisdom develops in three stages. The first of these stages is the wisdom born of learning, called Suttamaya Panya. We don't have to become scholars of the scriptures, but before engaging in practice, we have to acquire some basic knowledge of the framework, the doctrinal framework of the teaching by means of learning. And this study of the teaching leads to the wisdom born of learning. Then, having acquired this degree of understanding, the seed of wisdom, in the second stage we have to develop the wisdom born of reflection, chintamaya panya, 
wisdom born of reflection. We have to examine the teachings we have learned. We have to explore them. We have to see if they're consistent, if they hold up, if they make sense. We have to check them out against our own experience and see if they can be verified in our own experience. Then, when we've seen that the teachings are valid, then we apply ourselves to realize the inner meaning of the teaching by the means of meditation. And the practice of meditation here leads to the third level of wisdom called Bhavana Maya Panya, the wisdom born of meditation. So in actualizing the teaching of the Buddha, we have to pass through these three stages one by one. First, learning, then reflection, and then meditation. Meditation transforms the content of learning and reflection into actual experience. The present course is not intended to give a thorough and exact scholarly account of the Buddha's teaching. The aim is to lay down the fundamentals of the teaching which are essential as a foundation for practice. The teaching of the Buddha itself is called the Dhamma. The word Dhamma comes from the root Dara which means to uphold or sustain. Thus the word Dhamma means literally that which sustains. And the word Dhamma signifies the truth realized by the Buddha. It is the truth which subsists by itself, whether it is understood or not, whether it is taught or not. The true nature of phenomena, the real mode of existence of things. The word Tama also signifies the path that leads to the realization of the truth. And again, it signifies the doctrine which which elucidates the truth and which makes known the path. The Buddha does not create the Dhamma. The Buddha discovers the Dhamma through his enlightenment and he makes it known to the world. And his teaching gives a verbal formulation of the true Dhamma, which is itself to be realized by direct experience beyond words and formulas. And because the Buddha's teaching makes known the Dhamma, the self-subsistent Dhamma, the real nature of things and the true path to realization, the teaching also comes to be called the Dhamma. The presentation of the Dhamma that we will give in these lectures to follow is made from the standpoint of the Theravada school of Buddhism, which is the oldest continuous Buddhist lineage that preserves the teaching of the Buddha going back to the historical Buddha himself. Other schools of Buddhist thought, uh, other schools of Buddhist thought would present the Dhamma in other ways deriving from their own philosophical standpoint. The principal source for our talks is the Tipitaka, the Pali Canon, which consists of three collections of scripture preserved in the ancient Pali language. The three collections are the Vinaya Pitaka, the Sutta Pitaka, and the Abhidhamma Pitaka. The Vinaya Pitaka is the collection of discipline. This gives the rules and regulations for the orders of Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns. The Sutta Pitaka is the collection of suttas, the sermons and discourses of the Buddha and of some of his great disciples. The third collection, the Abhidhamma Pitaka, is the collection of philosophical treatises which present the Dhamma from the standpoint of a very precise philosophical and psychological analysis. Of these three collections, the one we have relied on mainly for our own presentation is the Sutta Pitaka, the collection of the Buddha's discourses. We've also utilized some of the commentaries 
would systemize and explain the teaching given in the discourse. Now we can come to the main topic of this first lecture, which is the Buddha himself. In one sutta, the Buddha says that one who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma. So one avenue of approach to seeing the Dhamma, the truth proclaimed by the Buddha, is by examining the teacher, by investigating the one who makes known the truth. The deeper we understand the nature of the Buddha, the deeper we understand the Dhamma, the teaching. And of course the converse is also true. The deeper we understand the teaching, the Dhamma, the deeper we understand the Buddha. Now the word Buddha is not a proper name, but an honorific title. The word comes from the Pali Sanskrit root Bud, B-U-D-H, meaning to understand, to know, or to awaken. The word Buddha thus means the one who has understood the truth, the enlightened one, the one who has awakened from the sleep of ignorance and who awakens others from the sleep of ignorance. He is the finder of truth and the proclaimer of truth. The historical person we know as the Buddha was an Indian prince of the Shakya people living in northern India. He renounced his right to the throne, became a religious seeker early in his life, and then, after reaching enlightenment, he became a spiritual teacher. His given name was Siddhartha, and his family name Gotama. He was not called the Buddha in his early years, but he acquired this designation only in his 35th year after he attained supreme enlightenment. However, when we say that the word Buddha is a title, this can be misleading. The word is actually not simply a title given to one particular individual, but it is a designation for a kind of, indi of individual. It represents not a single unique person, but a type of person. According to Buddhist tradition, only one Buddha, only one fully, perfectly enlightened one, can appear in any historical period. But throughout the cycles of world evolution, of cosmic evolution, there have been many Buddhas appearing one at a time, separated by vast intervals. Siddhartha Gotama is only the most recent Buddha, the one known to history. But all those persons who possess the requisite qualities, the completely enlightened world teachers, all of these gain the designation Buddha. An analogy can be drawn between the idea of a Buddha and the idea of the President of the United States. We apply the title the President only to the current leader of the United States of the American executive branch. But the word is applied to this man not in the sense that he is the only President the U.S. has ever had but because he is the latest president, the current president. But there have been many presidents in the past, and there will be more in the future as well. The word president applies to all those persons in succession, from the first American president up to the present one. All those persons who have been the leaders of the United States, of the executive branch of the United States government. 
Similarly, the title Buddha applies not only to the present Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, but also to all those persons in the succession or lineage of enlightened ones who have appeared in the world going back to the ages of the past and going ahead into the future as well. Now this raises a question. The question, what is a Buddha? What are the distinguishing qualities of this type of person that receives the designation Buddha? We can answer this question from two standpoints. Firstly, from the standpoint of function, and secondly, from the standpoint of attributes or qualities. We begin with the standpoint of function. And to answer this question from the standpoint of function, we have to begin by considering certain aspects of the Buddhist cosmology, the Buddhist worldview. According to Buddha's teaching, the physical universe has no discoverable limits in space and time. The universe is spread out boundlessly without any first beginning in time and without any limits to its spatial dimensions. The universe spread out in space and time consists of countless world systems called lokadatus, which exist throughout the universe like waves upon a vast ocean. Each world system goes through certain stages of development. It emerges from a state of undifferentiated matter Gradually, it solidifies and takes on shape. It gives rise to worlds like galaxies which bear intelligent life. These world, each world system evolves until it reaches a certain maximum point of development. Then it begins to deteriorate until at the end it disintegrates and undergoes complete destruction. It becomes reduced again to undifferentiated matter. The lifetime of a world system, from the time it begins to evolve until the time it becomes completely destroyed, this period is called a kalpa, a kappa, an aeon. This is the time unit of cosmic measurement a time unit of immense duration, of duration which is staggering to the mind. The early Buddhist texts give a simile to illustrate the time occupied by a kalpa. One time a monk comes to the Buddha and says to him, Bhante, Venerable Sir, could you please explain or tell me the length of a kalpa? The Buddha replies, he says, It isn't easy to give a figure to make known the length of a kalpa. Then the monk asks, Well, can you give a simile? The Buddha says, Yes, I will give you a simile. He says, Monk, suppose there is a mountain, a yojana high and a yojana wide, all the, the mountain made entirely out of solid rock. A yojana is a measurement of length equal to about seven miles. So we have a mountain seven miles high, seven miles all around, made out of solid rock. Then the Buddha continues, he says, Once every hundred years, a man comes by with a piece of cloth made out of banari silk, very fine silk, and he brushes against that mountain with his piece of cloth. Sooner would that man wear away that entire mountain of solid rock, but the kalpa would not yet reach its end. Such is the length of the kalpa. 
Now, within each world system existing throughout the Kalpa, there are different planes of sentient existence, different realms of life. There is the human plane, which is evident to us. Then above the human plane, there are certain other planes of existence, which we call the heavenly worlds, the divine realms. And then below the human realm, there are certain other planes of existence, planes of inferior types of beings. All of these planes are inhabited by living beings. And in all of these planes of existence, Life is subject to the same law, the law of impermanence, the law of arising and passing away. Just as the world systems themselves come into being, dissolve and perish, so living beings also are caught up in the same cycle, the cycle of becoming, of impermanence, of arising and passing away. And the living beings revolve in a cycle of becoming. They pass through a chain of rebirths, linking together innumerable existences. The beings again and again pass through the same cycle of birth, growth, aging, and death. This round of becoming, the round of rebirth, is called Sangsara, the wandering on, the cycle of existence. Beings arise in one plane of existence, remain there for the duration of their lifespan, then they pass away to take rebirth in some other plane. Thus all life is caught up in the cycle of arising and passing away. And for this reason, every plane of existence is seen as fundamentally unsatisfactory, as subject to suffering, either directly or indirectly, either in some gross, evident way or in some subtle, hidden way. There is no plane of existence, even the highest heavens, which is exempt from the fate of destruction. And therefore, every plane of existence, the heavens, the human realm, the lower worlds, are all encompassed in the range of dukkha, of suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Now, outside and beyond the wheel of becoming, the phenomenal universe with its world systems arising and passing away, there exists another state, an unconditioned state, a state of emancipation, of perfect bliss, of unfading peace. This state is called in Pali Nibbana, in Sanskrit Nirvana. Also there exists a path, a way which leads from one state to the other, from the impermanence and suffering of samsara to the bliss and peace of Nibbana. This is the noble Eightfold Path. And in the history of any particular world system, there will be periods when this path is known and followed. And there will be people who practice the path and by practicing it are able to reach final deliverance to reach the attainment of nirvana. But inevitably there comes a time when that path falls into neglect, when the knowledge of the path fades from people's minds until a path disappears and becomes lost. And when the path becomes lost, this means the loss of the way to deliverance the way to, to Nibbana. Emancipation from the round of existence then becomes nearly impossible. It becomes just a legend or a vague dream of something in the distant past. And when the path is lost, 
there then follows a period of spiritual darkness, a period which might last for hundreds, for millions of years, even for many aeons. <coughs> but eventually, this long spiritual darkness comes to an end. Eventually, there arises within samsara a certain being, a man who by his own innate wisdom, by his own striving and energy, without any guide or teacher, rediscovers that lost path to deliverance. Then having rediscovered that path, he follows it through to its end. He realizes the goal. He reaches Nibbana. Then he comes back to proclaim that path, to make it known again to the world. The man who accomplishes this twofold task, of rediscovering the path to nirvana and of making it known again to the world, this person is called a Buddha. A Buddha does not arise as a deity of any kind or as the incarnation of a god, an avatar, a prophet or a divinely inspired messenger. He comes as a human being he begins as a man caught up like ourselves in the round of suffering and defilement in which all beings are caught up. However, he is not an ordinary man, but an extraordinary man, an Acharya Purisa. He is, an extraordinary, he is an extraordinary man with immense potentials of intelligence, energy and compassion which he has developed over countless lifetimes of self-cultivation. Throughout countless lifetimes he has prepared himself for his future role as a Buddha by perfecting in himself the required qualities, the virtue, the powers, the wisdom needed by a world teacher. In his last existence, he quickly discerns the fundamental inadequacy of human life. Through his inner sense of mission, he goes forth to seek a way out of the bondage and suffering, and then out of compassion, after discovering the way, he comes back to teach the path to the world at large. We see this function of the Buddha illustrated for us in the suttas. In one sutta, the Buddha gives an analogy. He says, suppose there is a certain district where the people are living in great poverty and they're looking for an escape from their condition. Then from among their midst, a certain man appears who goes into the forest seeking for some other land to which he can bring his fellow countrymen. Suddenly he discovers a track running through the forest. He follows that track through until he comes to an ancient city, a very beautiful and wonderful city that has been inhabited by people in the past but is now deserted. Having found that city, he then returns to his own city, and he leads his countrymen there. They revive the city until it becomes prosperous, successful, and flourishing. In the same way, the Buddha says, I have discovered this path leading out from the impoverished city of Sangsara, the round of birth and death, the round of suffering, to the splendid city of Nibbana, the place of deliverance. And having found that path, I make it known the way to freedom from birth, aging, and death. So that is the special function of a Buddha, to rediscover the lost path to deliverance, to liberation, and to make that path known to the world at large. And by making it known to the world, the Buddha throws open the road to deliverance, 
to all humanity so that others can follow the path and by following it reach the same goal of liberation that the Buddha himself has reached. The Buddhas are not unique in achieving release from samsara. All those who follow it through, who follow the path through to the end, reach the same goal. These people are called arahants, accomplished ones, perfectly liberated ones. The specialty of the Buddha's function is the rediscovery and reproclamation of the path. Once it is known, those who learn the teaching can follow it through and reach the same goal. The second standpoint from which we can discuss the special nature of a Buddha is the standpoint of the qualities of a Buddha. And these can be dealt with from two angles as the elimination of all defects and the achievement of excellent qualities. The elimination of all defects means that the Buddha has eliminated all defilements. The defilements, these are called in Pali, kilesas, which means literally that which afflicts. The defilements are certain mental qualities Factors of mind which cause affliction, bondage, and eventually suffering. The three basic defilements are greed, hatred, and delusion. And out of these three emerge many secondary defilements. Conceit, jealousy, selfishness, wrong views, anger, hostility laziness, presumption, obstinacy, vanity, and so forth and so on. A Buddha has eliminated all of these defilements totally, completely, and irreversibly. When we say that he's eliminated them totally, that means that the Buddha has eliminated all the defilements with none remaining. When we say that he's eliminated them completely, that means he has eliminated each defilement 100%, so that not even a fraction of any defilement remains left over in his mind. And when we say that he's eliminated all the defilements irreversibly, this means he has eliminated them in such a way that they can no longer arise again in the future. In the text, they are said to be cut off at the root, made baseless like a palm tree that has been drawn up by the stump. They've been made of a nature not to occur again in the future. Then, from the second angle, the achievement of excellent qualities can be understood through the three excellent qualities, the three gunas, characteristic of the Buddha. These are his perfect purity, his great wisdom, and his great compassion. The purity of the Buddha follows from his eradication of all defilements. Because he has eliminated all defilements, His actions of body, speech, and mind are totally pure. The Buddha can never commit any impure bodily action, such as hurting others, stealing, sensual indulgence, and so on. He can never make any impure statement, any statement which is false, malicious, harmful to others, or frivolous. And he can never think any impure thought, any thought motivated by greed, hatred, delusion, or any other defilement. That is the Buddha's complete purity, his purification of body, 
speech and mind. The second distinguishing quality of the Buddha is his wisdom or knowledge. In fact, it is this quality which is signified by the term enlightenment. The wisdom of the Buddha has depth, precision, and range. The Buddha understands things in their deepest nature, in their most profound nature. He understands things with precision, exactly, truly as they are. And his knowledge has vast range. His knowledge can proceed unhindered to understand deeply and profoundly whatever he turns his attention to. The Buddha is called the Lokavitu, the knower of the world. And he's given this designation because his knowledge encompasses the countless world systems with their many planes of existence. And the Buddha's knowledge is a practical type of knowledge. He knows the minds and hearts of living beings, their degrees of spiritual maturity, their capacity to understand and he knows the right way to present the teaching to them in order to awaken their understanding, to bring them to deliverance. The third quality of the Buddha is his great compassion, Maha Karuna. The wisdom of the Buddha is guided by this compassion. Through compassion, the Buddha empathizes with sentient beings caught up in the cycle of suffering. And through compassion, he works to alleviate the suffering of beings by teaching the Dhamma, by making known to them the Dhamma that will lead them to liberation. Okay, to summarize then the answer to our original question, what is a Buddha? We answer this question from two standpoints, the standpoint of function and the standpoint of qualities. From the standpoint of function, a Buddha is a world teacher, one who discovers the Dhamma by himself without a guide, without an instructor, and makes the Dhamma known again to the world. Then from the standpoint of qualities, the Buddha is one who has eliminated all defects, all the defilements, and who has acquired the excellent qualities of perfect purity, wisdom, and compassion. The full status of a Buddha is not necessary to reach enlightenment. Those who attain enlightenment through the instructions of a Buddha, these are called arahants. These are the liberated, accomplished followers of a Buddha. The the question is sometimes raised as to the difference between a Buddha and an arahant. The Buddha himself states the answer in a sutta. He says that both a perfectly enlightened Buddha and the arahant are identical in reaching the liberating wisdom of enlightenment. Both are completely free from all defilements. Both are liberated from the round of suffering, the round of birth and death. The difference is that the Buddha discovers the path without a teacher and proclaims the path to others while the Arahant, the liberated disciple, learns the path from a Buddha and reaches the goal afterwards with the guidance of a Buddha. Also, the Buddha has special outstanding qualities, powers of knowledge and compassion, which enable him to establish the Dhamma in the world and function as a world teacher. At a single time, there can be only, even in a single historical period, there can be only one Buddha, but there can be many Arahants. 
many disciples who learn the teaching from a Buddha follow it and reach enlightenment through the path he makes known. From, from this general account of the nature of a Buddha, we now come to consider the specific person known to history as the Buddha. His life, like that of most great religious teachers, has been adorned with miracles and legends. But from this mass of myth, a historical core can be found. And even the mythical element should not be dismissed as just pure fantasy since much of it conveys important message at the doctrinal level. The Buddha's given name, as we mentioned, was Siddhartha. His family name was Gotama. And Buddhists know him as the Buddha Gotama, or the Buddha Shakyamuni, the sage of the Shakya clan. The dates for his life, accepted now by most historically oriented scholars, are 563 B.C. to 483 B.C., though other dates are also recognized. Though for history the story of the Buddha begins with his birth, from the traditional Buddhist perspective, the story goes back much further. It goes back aeons and aeons into the past. For every Buddha arrives at his high attainment through a career spanning many lives. During this period he is called a bodhisattva, a being bound for complete enlightenment. And in his successive lives as a bodhisattva he works to perfect in himself certain virtues that come to maturity with his attainment of Buddhahood. According to the Pali sources, the Bodhisattva career of our own Buddha began countless kalpas, hundreds and thousands of kalpas, aeons in the past. In the dispensation of a Buddha named Dipankara, who is the 26th Buddha before Gotama. At that time, our own future Buddha was a wealthy young man named Sumedha. When his parents died and left him a great amount of wealth, he reflected upon the impermanence of all wealth and worldly enjoyment. Then he renounced the household life and became a hermit, living in the forest, practicing meditation. One day he came into the town in order to gather supplies, and on that occasion he learned that a, an enlightened being, the Buddha Dipankara, was coming into the town. Then, when the Buddha Dipankara entered the town, the hermit Sumedha saw him coming, and he was so awed by his majestic bearing, by his presence, by his serenity, by his majesty, that he bowed down at his feet, right down in the mud, and he made an aspiration in his mind that he too wanted to become a Buddha sometime in the future. Then, when the Buddha Dipankara came up to him, he saw this ascetic bow down, laying down in the mud at his feet. He read his mind, and he saw his wish. Then he looked into the future, and he saw that this aspiration could succeed. And he then gave him the prediction that so many hundreds and thousands of aeons in the future, that this person would become a Buddha named Gotama. From that time on, this person, this being, became a bodhisattva in the proper sense of the term. And from then on, for hundreds and thousands of aeons, he had to dedicate himself to the development of the sublime virtues that would fructify with his Buddhahood. These virtues are called the paramis, the sublime perfections. And in the Theravada tradition, ten paramis are enumerated. These are ger generosity, moral discipline, renunciation, wisdom, energy, patience, truthfulness, 
determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. For countless lives, life after life, the Bodhisattva toiled and strived to perfect these qualities in himself. Sometimes he would dedicate several lives in succession to the development of one parami. Sometimes he would dedicate several lives to the perfecting of another parami. Sometimes he would appear as an animal, sometimes as a human being, sometimes as a deity. Sometimes he would be striving to develop concentration and insight, living as a hermit, as a recluse. Sometimes he would be striving to perfect the other directed virtues, generosity, patience, loving kindness. Buddhahood is a totalistic accomplishment, a very complete, all-embracing accomplishment. And all the qualities that enter into this complete perfection have to be acquired gradually in bits and pieces over many lifetimes. In his last life as a bodhisattva, the future Buddha took birth as the son of King Suddhodana and Queen Mahamaya. He took birth among the Shakyan people in the northern kingdom, in the kingdom, small kingdom of northern India, in the foothills of the Himalayas, and he grew up in the city, the capital city of the Shakyan, Kapilavattu. His birth, according to the text, was attended by many miracles and wonders. Soon after he was born and brought back into the palace, a great ascetic, a Sita, came to visit the palace and he worshipped the newborn child. After he was born, his father, the king, called in the court astrologers to foretell his future. Eight Brahmins, noteworthy astrologers, came to examine the baby, looked at the signs of his body, consulted his horoscope. And when they finished, all the astrologers, with one exception, held up two fingers. The father was perplexed about this and asked, what is the meaning of this strange sign? The Brahmins replied, they said, Your Majesty, a great destiny lies open for this newborn child of yours. But there are two possible destinies open to him. If this child of yours is shielded from the sorrows of the world, he will grow up to become a great emperor, a Chakavati Raja, a universal emperor who will extend his rule over many lands and bring great benefits to many people. However, they said, if your child sees for himself the sufferings of the world, he will leave the household life and become a Buddha, an enlightened one, who will roll back the veils of delusion from the world and become a spiritual teacher whose teaching will spread throughout the world. But the one Brahmin who held up one finger said that for him he had no doubt that the prince would become a Buddha. Now the father, being a ruler himself, naturally didn't want his son to become an ascetic spiritual teacher. He wanted him to become a ruler, the proper heir to his throne. And so the father did everything he could to prevent his son from seeing the sufferings of the world. He built for him three palaces, one for each season, according to the Indian climate. Each palace had lovely pleasure gardens, ponds, fountains, flower beds, and so on. The young prince lived in luxury, always attended by musicians, dancers, and singers. He enjoyed himself in the company of youthful playmates, singing, dancing, playing in sports. Then when he reached manhood, his father arranged for him marriage with the beautiful princess Yasodhara, and he lived happily with his wife in the palace. But when he reached 
his 29th year, he became increasingly reflective, more and more thoughtful. He began to wonder whether this was the ultimate goal of human life, pleasure, power, and fame, which were all transient and unreliable. Or he wondered, is there something more beyond this, something which is eternal and unchanging? <coughs> His first encounter with the hard facts of life is told in the text in the form of a myth a myth that expresses a real and powerful psychological awakening. According to this myth, up to his 29th year, the prince Siddhartha knew nothing at all about aging, sickness, and death. His father had arranged to screen him totally from exposure to these facts, and so he lived in a totally illusory world in which these hard facts of life were completely hidden from him. Then when he reached maturity, curiosity led him to wonder what life was like outside the palace. And so one day he ordered his charioteer to prepare the chariot for him, and the two went riding throughout the kingdom. And in the course of this outing, he saw four sights which determined his future destiny. The first sight he saw was that of an old man. As they went riding, he came across a man walking by the side of a road, bent over, leaning on a walking stick, his hair gray, his skin wrinkled, his teeth falling out, very weak. He asked his driver, what is that? The driver said, that is an old man. He asked, what is an old man? The driver explained, all youth eventually leads to old age. Nobody remains young forever. But as the years by, event, as the years go by, eventually the hair turns gray, the skin wrinkles. One reaches a state like that. Am I subject to that also? You and everybody else, we're all subject to old age. Then as they drove further, he saw a sick man lying by the side of a road, his body covered with sores, trembling and shaking, vomiting, without able to control his limbs. Again, the same kind of exchange went on. Now he saw for himself, for the first time, the fact of sickness. As they went a little further, he saw the third sight. He saw a funeral procession. Four bearers carrying the coffin. Inside the coffin he saw the corpse, the body lying still and lifeless. This was his encounter with the fact of death. And these sights aroused in him an understanding that shattered all of his illusions, all his hopes and dreams for the future. He realized that even though he now enjoyed the beauty and the glory of youth, that youth ends in old age. He saw that health succumbs to sickness, that life ends in death. And as these thoughts bore into his mind, his satisfaction with the luxury of the palace life fell away, and he became inwardly very dissatisfied, very discontent. Then he saw a fourth sight. This was a summoner an ascetic walking for alms in the town, walking very peacefully and serenely, carrying an alms bowl. He approached this man, asked him who he was and why he was different from other men. And the ascetic explained to him that I am a recluse. I live in the forest. I lead a life of meditation, seeking a way to enlightenment, a way to deliverance from suffering. And when he heard these words, the prince now knew the direction in which he had to move. And so he decided to leave the palace and to follow the quest for spiritual truth, seeking a way out of the round of suffering, of aging and death, 
by entering upon the life of an ascetic. So one night, this was on the same day that his wife Yasodhara had given birth to his first son, Rahula. That night, while everyone in the palace was asleep, he left the palace, got onto his horse, and went many miles from the city of Kapalavattu and stopped at the edge of a forest. There he removed his princely garments, replaced them with these stitched robes of an ascetic, cut off his hair and his beard, and he entered the forest seeking a way to deliverance. At the time in ancient India, there were many famous religious teachers who were known for their systems of philosophy and their schools of meditation. The young prince, the young seeker, we can now call the Bodhisattva, went to the best-known teachers. He mastered their philosophies, he practiced their forms of meditation to the highest point. His teachers recognized his eminence. His first teacher, Alara Kalama, offered to place him on a level with himself and to share the leadership of his own community with him. But the prince, the bodhisattva, refused. He was dissatisfied with his teacher. He went to seek out another teacher. He mastered his doctrine, mastered his system of meditation till he reached the crown, the highest point. But still he found this deficient. His teacher, Uttaka Ramaputta, admitted that his own attainment was superior to his own. And he offered to turn over the leadership of the order to him. But in this case, too, the Bodhisattva refused and left the fold. Now, what was wrong with these systems of meditation that he found them to be deficient? What was wrong with them? What was wrong with them was that these forms of meditation focused exclusively on concentration, samadhi, rather than panya, wisdom. They led to higher states of consciousness, to rapturous bliss, to stillness and calm of the mind, to deep stages of absorption. But they didn't lead to insight into truth, to awakening, to enlightenment, and therefore they were inadequate to bring about the state of liberation. And so the Bodhisattva abandoned these teachers and their systems and threw himself into deeper into the forest in order to enter upon a new path for himself, the path of self-mortification. In India at the time, it was commonly believed that the way to liberation lay in afflicting the body. And so the Bodhisattva took up this path of, ascet- of asceticism. Later, after his enlightenment, he said that he followed this path to its utmost limits, to an extent that no one had ever carried it before. He reduced his intake of food, fasting for weeks on end. He went about naked, exposing his body to the heat of the sun, to the cold of night, to the rain and to the winds. He went about like an animal on hands and knees. His body became reduced to a skeleton covered over with just a small amount of flesh and with skin. He became so thin that if he reached down to take to touch his belly, he was able to feel his backbone through his belly. If he reached behind to touch his backbone, he was able to grasp hold of the skin of his belly. At the time, he was accompanied by five ascetics who gathered around him, willing to serve him and attend on him in the belief that if there was anybody who was going to reach supreme enlightenment, it was this great ascetic, this very severe ascetic, who was a former prince. And so they waited on him and served him. However, the Bodhisattva found that all of these austerities only proved futile. They didn't lead to any enlightenment, to any state of higher wisdom, 
They led only to the wasting of the body and to the weakening of the mental faculties. He understood that for the mind to function properly at full capacity, the body had to be strong and healthy, and therefore he decided to abandon this course of self-mortification and to resume taking food again. And so he went to gather alms, he collected food, he began to eat, until he had regained his strength and vigor. And when this happened, then the five ascetics became disgusted with him. They thought that he had abandoned his spiritual exertions, that he had decided to revert to a life of luxury, and so they left him all alone. Then, when he was alone, that was the moment, the time, when the approach of enlightenment was drawing near. And so one day, after he had taken his alms, he came to a beautiful spot by the bank of a river, found a nice shady area beneath a tree, which is called later to be called the Bodhi tree, the tree of enlightenment. He prepared himself a seat of grass, sat down, folded his legs in the cross-legged posture, and when he sat there, he then made a firm resolution, a determination in his mind. He said, let my flesh waste away until only bones and skin remain. But I will not budge from this seat. I will not unlock my legs until I have reached supreme enlightenment, until I have found the way to deliverance. Then there took place the struggle for enlightenment. As evening descended, a tremendous internal struggle waged itself within the mind of the seeker. A struggle against all the defilements, all the attachments, the ignorance and afflictions which had been lying dormant in his mind. In the text, the struggle is depicted allegorically as a battle with Mara, the personification of all desire and attachment the tempter, the evil one. When the Bodha, Bodhisattva crosses his legs in meditation and begins to focus his mind, Mara learns what he is doing, and Mara calls together all of his armies and hordes of demons and approaches the Bodhisattva sitting beneath the tree. He comes to him and tries to tempt him in different ways. He offers him honor, power, and fame, sovereignty over the whole world. He appeals to his love of family life, his love for his wife, parents, and ch child. Then he tries to frighten him with thunder and lightning, throwing weapons at him, displaying many horrible forms. He tries to seduce him with the delights of the senses, sending his daughters delight and attachment and pleasure, the seductive daughters of Mara he sends to try to seduce him and lead him into the pathways of sensuous pleasure. But still the Bodhisattva remains unmoved. Then finally Mara challenges his very right to be sitting underneath the Bodhi tree. He says, what right do you have to be sitting at this spot this doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me. He turns around to all of his soldiers, his hordes of demons, and says, isn't that right? All of the demons say, yes, that's right. He has to get up and leave. What right do you have to be challenging? Who can witness for your right to be here? The Bodhisattva is sitting there all alone. All of the deities who have been watching the struggle have all fled. They've all been terrified by the troops of Mara. But the Bodhisattva then reaches down his hand and touches the ground and says, The earth shall be my witness. Perhaps many have seen the statue of the Buddha sitting with his right hand touching the ground. That's the earth witnessing posture. The Bodhisattva is calling the earth to witness to his own fulfillment 
of all the paramis. And when the Bodhisattva calls upon the earth to witness, then the earth shakes, trembles and quakes and sends out its applause saying, yes, he has fulfilled all of the paramis, all the perfection. Then the hosts of Mara all become terrified and all flee. And Mara himself recognizes that he is defeated and leaves. Then the Bodhisattva enters into deeper and deeper states of meditation, the four jhanas in which his mind becomes perfectly calm and stilled. Then with his mind calm and concentrated, the realizations of wisdom begin to unfold. These take place over the three watches of the night. In the first watch of the night, he recollects all of his former lives. He sees himself again and again through the innumerable kalpas, going through the stages of birth, growth, aging, and death. He sees himself with different names, with different forms, with different relations. He sees everything changing, transient, mutable, the dreamlike quality of all forms becomes evident to him as he goes through one life drama after another, seeing how they all change and all fall away. In the second watch of the night, he develops the divine eye with which he's able to look out upon the world and see the rise and passing away of all sentient beings. He sees how beings take birth according to their karma, how they reap the fruits of their good and evil actions. He sees the world systems evolve and dissolve, arise and pass away, and he understands the universal laws at work beneath the surface manifestations of things. Then in the third watch of the night, he penetrates the deepest truths of the Dhamma. He discovers the law of dependent arising, Paticca Samupada. He develops Vipassana, insight into the real characteristics of all things. And he arrives at the realization of the four noble truths. At the end of the night, his mind is liberated from all the screens of ignorance and he sits beneath the Bodhi tree, no longer a Bodhisattva, a seeker of enlightenment, but now a finder of enlightenment, a Sama Sambuddha, a perfectly enlightened one. For several weeks, the newly enlightened Buddha remained in the vicinity of the Bodhi tree, contemplating the truths he had discovered. Then he faced the challenge of still one more decision, whether to go out and try to teach or whether to remain silent and stay in the forest. When he reflected for the first time on this question, he decided not to teach, to pass his days quietly in the forest and to enter into nirvana silently by himself. The Dhamma, he, taught, he thought, is just too deep and people are too attached to their pleasures and to their worldly aims. If I tried to teach, nobody would be interested in learning the Dhamma. No one would try to understand. And if I were to try to teach, it would just be too wearisome and too troublesome for me. But then his mind inclined in the other direction. And this change in his inclination is again illustrated allegorically in the text. It is said that when the Buddha decided not to teach, then Brahma Sahampati, the divinity who rules over one of the high heavenly worlds, comes down from this heavenly world and appears before the Buddha, speaking for all sentient beings in the world, he urges him to go forth and teach out of compassion for sentient beings. 
There are some beings, he says, who have little dust in their eyes. Some beings who will understand the Dhamma. The Buddha then complies with the request of Brahma Sahampati. He gazes out upon the world and he sees that living beings are like lotuses in a pond at different stages of growth. He sees that some, like there are some lotuses near the surface which need only the sun's rays in order to unfold. And in the same way he sees that there are some people whose eyes are covered with only a little bit of dust who need only to hear the Dhamma to open enlightenment and to gain deliverance. And when he sees this, he makes the decision to go forth to teach. For his first hearers, he chooses the five ascetics who previously used to wait upon him but left him when he abandoned the course of self-mortification. These ascetics are now staying at the deer park at Sarnath near Benares. And as the Buddha approaches them, when they see him coming, they make the decision, the collective decision, not to get up and greet him, to treat him casually, without any special respect, because they all agree that he's one who's fallen away from his high aspirations, one who's reverted to a life of luxury. But as the Buddha approaches, as he draws near, they can't maintain their agreement. His bearing, his figure is just so majestic, his faculty so pure, his expression so serene, that they get up to greet him, take his bowl and robe, bow to him and express their willingness to listen to his words. In the first discourse, the Buddha then explains to them the middle way. He says that he has not abandoned the higher aspirations, but in a fact that he's achieved the supreme goal. He says that he's discovered the middle way the noble eightfold path which avoids the extremes of indulgence and luxury on the one hand and the extreme of self-mortification on the other hand. Then he goes on to proclaim the four noble truths and to tell how his discovery of the four noble truths issued in his enlightenment. At the end of the discourse, the senior-most ascetic, whose name is Kondanya, grasps the Dhamma. He opens his mental eye and he reaches the first stage of enlightenment, the stage of stream entry. Then, with some further elaborations, the other four ascetics also gain understanding. Then, after the second sermon, the discourse on anatta or selflessness, all the five ascetics gain arhatship full enlightenment and liberation of the mind. In the months ahead, the Buddha's following expands by leaps and by bounds. He soon gathers around himself a group of young men who enter the order and with a little bit of teaching achieve arhatship. At the end of the first rains retreat, the Buddha gathers the 60 disciples around him who are all arhants and then he sends them out into the world to spread the liberating message of the Dhamma. And in his talk he emphasizes compassion as the motive for teaching. He says, Monks, I am freed from all fetters human and divine and you too are free from all fetters. Therefore, go forth into the world for the good of the many folk, for the happiness of the many folk, out of compassion for the world, and teach the Dhamma. Make known the Dhamma which is pure in the beginning, pure in the middle, pure in the end. Teach the holy life completely purified and perfect. The Buddha himself then commenced his long career of wandering 
that was to lead him from town to town, from village to village in northern India. In the second year after his enlightenment, he visited his home city of Kapalavattu, and he taught the Dhamma to his family. Many of his relatives, including his father in former life, embraced the Dhamma and reached various stages of enlightenment. His son, Rahula, became a novice monk, and his wife, Yasodhara, became a laywoman and afterwards became a bhikkhuni, a nun. Each year, year, the Buddha would spend the four months of the rainy season in a single residence, most often either at Jaitavana in the town of Savati or in the bamboo grove near Rajagriha. The other eight months of the year, he would spend wandering and teaching. Time doesn't allow us to deal with the details of the Buddha's ministry here, but the question can be raised why the Dhamma spread so rapidly, why it had such drawing power. These questions are especially important to us because the answers aren't confined to any single time period or country, but bring us to what is universal in the Buddha's teaching, hence to what is relevant to us right here and now. I think the rapid spread of the Buddha's Dhamma can be understood through the aim of the teaching and through the method that the Buddha lays down to achieve that aim. The Buddha's teaching speaks directly to the central problem at the core of human existence, the problem of suffering, and it offers to show a way out of suffering to perfect peace, to unconditioned happiness. The entire doctrine of the Buddha flows between these two points, suffering and the end of suffering. Every other consideration, all the speculations, the metaphysical concerns, the dogmatic subtleties that often infest religion, all of these are set aside as irrelevant. And not only does the Buddha make suffering and its cessation, the focal point of his teaching, but he deals with the problem in a very realistic way, a way that is personal and immediate, a way that can be verified in our own experience. He traces suffering to its roots right in our own mind, in our own greed, our hatred, our delusion, and he holds that the cure, the solution, also has to be found in our minds, in purifying our minds from all of these defilements. As a result of this diagnosis, the Buddha rejects all extraneous religious forms which involve external reliances, the performance of rituals and sacrifices, the appeal to authoritative books, reliance on priests and saviors, the reliance on divine figures to grant us salvation. The Buddha emphasizes that self-reliance is the key to deliverance. He says to his disciples, he says, be islands to yourselves, be a refuge to yourselves, look to no external refuge. As the way to deliverance, he holds up purified conduct and correct understanding. And even the Buddha functions simply as a teacher of the path, not as a savior who grants salvation. The Buddha points out that the path to the end of suffering has to be followed each one by himself. The Buddha can show the path, but each person has to follow it according to his own energy and his own understanding. (coughs) For this reason, the Buddha rejects the call for blind faith and belief. He doesn't want disciples who merely believe in him or accept his doctrine out of respect or through faith, but he asks his followers to examine his teaching, to investigate it, until they become convinced of it themselves. He says that just as a goldsmith, if he's given a lump of metal and told that it's gold, 
He doesn't merely accept this through belief, but he tests and examines it by burning, cutting, and scraping until he's convinced that it's gold. So in the same way he says to his disciples, accept my doctrine only after examining and scrutinizing it, not merely out of respect for me. Another appeal of the Dhamma that accounts for its rapid spread, I think, lies in its universality. The Buddha taught the Dhamma freely and openly to all who are willing to listen. He says, open to all are the gates of the deathless. His doctrine deals with the most universal problem, the problem of suffering. And hence, he placed no restrictions on the people to whom it should be taught. The Buddha taught to people of all social classes, whether they be Brahmins, aristocrats, merchants, farmers, businessmen, poor people, even outcasts. He taught to people of all different occupations, to men and to women, to recluses and lay people. He had no esotericism. There was nothing secret, hidden or concealed, nothing reserved only for the initiated. He says that just as the sun and the moon become beautiful when they shine forth openly, so does his doctrine reveal its beauty when it's taught openly, not when it's hidden or kept secret. Another feature of the Buddha's method, I think, which accounts for its rapid spread, was his skillful means. The Buddha had a special skill in finding exactly the appropriate way to teach the person who had to be taught. Through his special faculties of knowledge, he could read deep into the hidden resources, into the hidden recesses of a person's heart. He could see the person's mental tendencies, his past accumulations, his preferences and his capacities, and then he could adapt the teaching according to the needs of the listener. And the Buddha taught his doctrine in a graduated way, not in a demanding way, but in a way which led gradually upwards, calling which led gradually upwards according to the capacity of the listener. And so the Buddha taught for 45 years, from his 35th year up to his 80th year. As he approached his 80th year, he knew that he had accomplished his mission. His doctrine had become widespread and fruitful. He had established the Sangha, the order of monks and nuns, and there were now large numbers of people, monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen, who had mastered the teaching, had opened enlightenment, and could see to the continued transmission of the Dhamma. As the Buddha was now old, the strength was failing, he was occasionally sick, and so he decided the time had come for his parinirvana, his final passing away. Thus he set out on his last journey accompanied by Ananda, his personal attendant, and by the order of monks. He traveled to the town of Kusinara, a small town in northern India. There he lay down between two twin salt trees. He gathered his disciples around him. He gave them a last discourse, and then he exhorted them. He said, O oh, my disciples, all conditioned things are impermanent, subject to destruction. Work out your salvation with, di with diligence. These were the Buddha's last words. He then entered into successive stages of meditation and from there attained parinirvana, the final passing away. His body was carried to the eastern gate of Kusinara, and there the chiefs of the town cremated it with the honors due to a universal monarch.